Hi, my name is Adrián Guesanguesa, and I'm going to talk about this paper entitled Using Players' Body Orientation to Model Pass Feasibility in Soccer. This is the group of researchers that conducted this project. We are both from Universidad Pompeu Fabra and Football Club Barcelona in Barcelona. The main motivation of this project emerged after some uh, Pep Guardiola's words that he claimed that back in the days, in yesteryear's soccer, uh, players used to first control the ball, then look around and finally make the pass. But in today's faster version of soccer, the first thing that players should do is orient and then control and pass. I'm going to show you now one example where orientation plays a crucial role in the outcome of one play. And here you can see Messi in the middle of the court, carrying the ball. And here he's directly looking at Suarez at his right side. So Suarez is a really nice candidate to receive the ball, while we have Griezmann in the other side that is not in the field of view of Messi, thus he has really low chances of receiving it. But Messi changes orientation, and just with one second, Griezmann becomes the best player to receive the ball. And in this case, he scores the goal afterwards. So with just one second and one turn of Messi, everything changed, the whole scenario changed, and Barca was able to score the goal in this possession. So when we watch soccer on TV or live, whatsoever, we always assume that uh, the passer here, that is the player that has this orange circle around, will always pass to a best oriented, less defended, closest available candidate. Okay, so based on all of this, we contribute in two ways that the first one is create some kind of geometrical solution on top of existing computer vision state-of-the-art techniques that indicate somehow the fit of orientation of between a passer and potential receivers. And then we also contribute by building some computational model that outputs one feasibility measure for every single receiving potential candidate that we have in the field. Our related work is also a paper of ours that is called Always Look on the Bright Side of the Field that as far as we know, it is the only method that can output body orientation of soccer players given video data. And this uh, uses open pose to get the coordinates of the four upper torso parts, which are shoulders and hips, and then projecting it into a 2D space and computing a normal vector, we can get one uh, orientation value for each timestamp for each player. So, the thing we want to build now, the pass orientation model, we start with this big picture. So for each pass event, we not only have the position of offensive players, we have the position of defensive players, and we have as well their orientation. So what we're gonna do is break it down into pieces and compute three different independent feasibility measures that one is based on orientation, the second one on defenders, and the third one on proximity, and then we'll combine them all together. We'll see them now. So the first one is orientation feasibility. And what we have is the position of opens and their orientation. So we want to create and, and see the fit between the orientation of the passer and potential receivers. What we are gonna do is model the field of view of every single receiver here by setting these cones of plus minus alpha degrees and side Z, and we can place them on top of them. And also we can do the same for the passer. The passer will use sides to Z, okay? And here we can start computing intersections and see what's going on. But first, in order to make it a uh, distance independent, we will move, and I will show an example with five players, we'll move these five players to a unit circle so uh, distance doesn't play a, a huge role here. So in this example, we zoom in and we can see that for these five players, we compute the intersection between the cone of the passer that is double sized with the cones of the, of the potential receivers uh, we formally express it with uh, in this way. And in this case, we see that player seven is the one producing higher intersection, thus being the player with higher feasibility in terms of orientation of receiving the ball. And this means that player seven uh, is the one having an orientation, the, an orientation that is better aligned with the one of the passer. And this means that a player number seven is the one having a better aligned orientation with, uh, when comparing it to the passer. Then we focus on defender's feasibility because when trying to make a pass, it does not only depend on the offense, but also on the defensive setup. The first thing that we should do is focus on the perspective of the passer. Can the passer move the ball towards one receiver in one particular direction? Does he or she have some kind of player blocking this passing line? So the passing line that we're talking about is, is crucial. 
is this orange line that uh, joins the passer and the potential receiver. And players that are close to that line will be uh, a really tough obstacle in order to make the ball move. So the basis of this feasibility is getting the mean distance of the three closest players. But we're going to introduce some weighting function that this is explained in the paper, is this W in the equation, that will penalize those, those players that are in the passing line, and this will add some extra value. So from the perspective of the passer, you can see here a couple of examples, but then we have to do it as well from the point of view of the receiver. So can the receiver receive the ball from a particular direction given the defensive setup? We'll do the same. We'll compute the, the mean uh, distance of the three closest players by using this weighting function that we explained before. Uh, once we have them, we can combine them since they are independent, we can use a straightforward product and then we'll have a measure that indicates the, the feasibility in terms of defensive pressure. And finally, we have proximity feasibility. This is super simple and it, it's according to the prior that players that are close to the passer have higher chances of receiving the ball than the ones that are far away. And just by computing Gaussian, placing the center of this Gaussian in the position of the passer, we can obtain this feasibility measure for each player in the field. And finally, since all of these uh, individual feasibilities are independent. We can combine them and then we'll have one feasibility measure for every single potential receiver that will have features of orientation, defensive pressure, and pairwise distances with respect to the passer. We used a data set with more than 6,000 pass events that was provided by uh, FC Barcelona. And we want to check the, the effect of adding orientation. So we are gonna compare two different types of, of feasibilities. The first one uses orientation, the second one doesn't. And we'll express the numerical results in top one and top three accuracy. So top one accuracy just means that if the player that received the ball it was the one that we predicted that had better, uh, higher uh, feasibility, then it's correct. Top one accuracy is more or less the same. So if the player that received the ball was in our top three feasibilities, uh, it's also correct. So we're going to see different scenarios and then what we want to do is compare successful against non-successful passes. And in particular, we, we would like to see that orientation produces boosts in successful uh, top one and top three accuracies and, and drops in top one and top three and non-successful passes accuracies. So we're gonna see these different uh, histograms. Uh, blue beans belong to successful passes and orange beans belong to non-successful passes. And as, as you can see in this table, well, uh, we are comparing at this point uh, the orientation relevance. So the first one, the first graphic only uses proximity and defenders, and the second one orientation plus proximity plus defenders. And as you might see, there's a, a boost of 7% in top one accuracy and 5% in top three accuracy, which is quite a lot, bearing in mind that we are working with more than 6,000 uh, passes. And at the same time, we're boosting the difference between top one uh, successful and non-successful passes is accuracy, which means that orientation really plays a vital role in, in the outcome of, of past events. Then we want to see the decomposed performance of orientation, proximity, and defenders. Or how do they behave on their own? And we can see that the one having highest top one and top three accuracy is uh, proximity. And this means that 34% of the times, the passer will pass to the guy, uh, to the player that is closer to him or, or her. And then the only thing, the only drawback of this proximity individual feasibility is that there's not much difference between successful and non-successful passes. This means that even if we pass to the player that is closer to us, this is not uh, enough guarantee that he or she will receive the ball properly. So that's when uh, the defender's uh, feasibility co comes, comes into, into play because the difference between uh, top one accuracy of successful and non-successful passes is almost 14%. So every single uh, feasibility estimation that we uh, computed here is complementary within each other and they boost the drawbacks. We also would like to see how this uh, accuracy uh, behaves depending on the type of player. So in the top row, we have defenders, middle row, we have midfielders, and in the bottom row, we have forwards. And it's pretty interesting to see how it behaves with midfielders because 
while defenders and forwards are most of the time looking to the offensive court, midfielders are always turning around because they have to get the ball from defense. And then they have to turn around, move along, and then pass it to forward. So as you might see in top one and top three accuracies, uh, we have a boost of almost, well, a little bit more of 10% even uh, in the case for midfielders, saying that they are the, the players that are mostly influenced by, by orientation. Then we would like also to combine our model with some existing state-of-the-art techniques. And in particular, we checked it with uh, expected possession value model. This was a paper introduced in the MIT's Lone Sports Analytics Conference of last year. And it is a model that predicts the posterior conditional probability of scoring or receiving a goal once the ball is moved to a particular position on the field. So uh, in this model, they also used a pass probability model, but this didn't use any kind of orientation features. So we managed to combine them. And as you might see in this, in this table, uh, both the pass probability model and expected possession value model benefit from using orientation features obtaining boosts of 8% and 7%. And in order to conclude and wrap up a little bit, uh, we build a computational model that outputs one feasibility measure for each potential receiving candidate uh, based on first orientation, then defensive pressure, and then pairwise distances between the passer and the receiver. We analyzed more than 6,000 passing events, and we saw that the, or the orientation made them improve in all scenarios uh, in terms of uh, top one and top three accuracy with tops 10% boost. Finally, the output of this model, we proved that we can combine it with some existing uh, set of the art techniques such as suspected position value. In terms of future work, uh, we would like to switch our discrete set of outputs to a field map because the pass does not only go to the receiver, it can also go to the space in front or behind the receiver whatsoever. So we want to change it to a map. And we also, at a high level, we would like to check the importance across different sports and perform some kind of team activity recognition as well. So thank you very much for your attention.